Um, welcome. We are so glad you are here. Um, this event is in celebration of the production of Love Person by Aditi Capillo, who's up there on that large screen right there. Um, in addition to all of you who are here with us in person, we also have an online audience. Hello, online audience. Nice to see you. There's a camera at the back of this room, and it's going to be broadcasting our conversation online. And we may also end up having questions that come in from our online audience for our two wonderful panelists, Aditi and Bonnie, who I will introduce momentarily. What that means is this center aisle should be kept clear if possible. If you have to leave the room, it's not a problem to walk in front of the camera. Just don't hang out there, is I guess all I would ask. <laughs> um, in terms of the logistics of this event, obviously the goal is to make it accessible for everyone. To that end, we have a couple of interpreters on staff with us today. So, obviously, we have <laughs> um, who will be signing for us for any questions that come from the audience um, will be signed up here. And any conversation that happens between Aditi and myself and Bonnie, Bonnie will sign for herself, obviously. But Aditi and I will be interpreted. The other half is that we have another fabulous interpreter up here in the chair. Actually, you can stand for a moment and say hi. <laughs> um, and she will be voicing any questions that come from the audience, and she will also voice for Bonnie. Is that correct? Great. Um, so, I guess what I would ask for our online audience, who can only see the people up here at the front, just know that there may be a lag for a moment or two while the interpreting is happening. And that's just part of what it means to have a completely accessible event. And we're excited to be here with all of you in the room and online. So, um, uh, I'm going to start with um, very brief introductions of both Aditi and of um, and I'll probably ask them to throw in a couple other words if they think I've missed anything um, really important, which is probable. Um, so I'm going to start with Aditi. Um, Aditi is a playwright who is based in Minneapolis. She is um, multinational in descent and in writing interests. Um, the majority of her work tends to take as if not the major theme, then at least a partial theme, questions of communication, um, uh, of understanding, of language in particular. Um, as a bilingual, or correct me, trilingual? How many linguals are you? Try. I'll think, I'll think, I'll think three. Great. <laughs> as a trilingual artist, um, most of her work tends to play with language quite a bit. This play uh, obviously does it. Um, and so uh, Aditi has also been represented on stages around the country. And she's been the recipient of several major awards, including uh, a new play development award granted by the NEA and the New Play Institute when it was housed at Arena Stage in Washington, DC. Um, so that's, that's Aditi in a nutshell, completely uh, um, sort of not adequate to describe the complexity of her work, but it's a start. <laughs> um, to my right is Bonnie Kaplan, who is the uh, Director of Cultural Affairs for BSA Massachusetts, which is the State Organization for Disability and the Arts. And because Bonnie has about a million major accomplishments, <laughs> I'm going to cheat for a second and read. Um, so, in addition to her uh, other work at the BSA, she also is in charge of the Open Door Gallery, Boston Art Reach, Inclusive by Design, 
and in the past, the National Cultural Access Institute. Uh, she provides technical assistance to program participants on universal program design and development of inclusive audiences, especially serving people who are deaf or hard of hearing. One of the things that I think makes Bonnie a perfect um, co-participant in this event today with Aditi about the world of this play and about what it means to intersect with this play is that um, not only does Bonnie have all of these amazing other qualifications, but she's no stranger to theater. Having co-produced uh, several things, including the Show of Hands uh, Deaf Theater Festival. So, um, today we're here and we're going to have a conversation for a little while between Bonnie and Aditi and myself. And then we're going to take questions from the audience. So, um, if you think of something, hold on to it. We will come back to you in about 20 minutes. Um, in the meantime, I should probably say who I am. My name is Ilana Brownstein, and I am the director of new work here at Company One. I also serve as the dramaturg on this show, which means that one of my jobs was to discover and present pathways into the world of the play for all of the various constituencies, whether that's the actors, the designers, the company, the community, or you in this room right now. So this kind of event that we're doing here is part of our larger goal in terms of um, finding new ways to communicate with um, a wider group of people who live and, and work and make Boston their home and, and potentially are willing to have a conversation with us. So we're really glad all of you are here. And to our online audiences, we're really glad you're here too. And we look forward to whatever questions you might have. Um, you can use the Twitter hashtag number sign new play in order to communicate with us during this event. Uh, this event will be about 45, 50 minutes, give or take. And um, afterwards, there'll be time to chat with any of us. We'll remain around, and uh, you can ask us any further questions you might have. So, with that, let's get started. Hi, Aditi. Um, Hi. <laughs> I will add, I guess, that um, we will just have to make some allowances for the weirdness of technology and Wi-Fi. Aditi's uh, um, Audio is coming through perfectly. It's a little bit choppy in the video. I'm sure it's the same for her uh, in terms of our video. So uh, we will um, roll with the punches, I'm sure. Uh, so, Aditi, I wanted to start by getting you to just talk very briefly about the impetus for writing this play. It is unusual for a hearing playwright to decide to take on deaf culture so um, intimately as you did. And I think. Um, It'd be great if you could share with our audiences what the, what the inspiration for that was. Um, the very first seeds of this play happened when um, I was, I've worked a lot with uh, deaf performers. I've voiced quite a bit with deaf performers. And I have one very good friend, her name is Nick Zapko, who is one of my favorite performers, deaf or hearing, or you know, um, in general, one of my favorite performers. Um, and I was voicing for her in a show and mixed blood theater. And at the same time, I was researching Sanskrit for a fiction project I was working on. And um, I was struck by a kind of poetic similarity between the two languages. And I had this idea of what if I wrote something where a deaf woman and a Sanskrit scholar fell in love based entirely on the affinity between their languages. And the first thing I did was try to write it as a short story, and it didn't work at all. It was terrible. And then a few years later, um, I thought actually that is a play because ASL is amazing on stage. Um, and I will say this: I didn't set out to write a play about deaf culture so much as to write a play that had both deaf and hearing characters in it, kind of in a naturalistic way, which is, I think, the difference. Um, while I made Nick and her partner Lisa talk to me so much during the time that we created this play, um, that was more so that I could get 
deeper deeper into their characters than anything else. But it's, it's a play that has both deaf and hearing characters, which is why I think it falls into this interesting in-between category between deaf and hearing theater. Mm. And um, this play has been produced at small and large stages, both. Mm. Um, one of the things you and I have talked about is uh, the challenges and opportunities that producing this play allows for a company that has not necessarily previously worked intimately with deaf artists or with the deaf community. So being a playwright and having watched this across a couple of different theaters over time, can you talk a little bit about your perception of what some of the challenges are and where some of the, the sort of common successes are around this? Oh, um, I think right when theaters embark on the play, consistently it's, they usually don't know quite what they're getting into. Um, if you haven't worked with uh, uh, deaf artists or in collaboration with deaf theaters before, you think there's no, there's no way you can anticipate all the different kind of treasures and challenges that are ahead of you. So I actually try to warn people. I always tell but like I'm telling people not to do my play, but I'm really just trying to warn them so that they go in with eyes open, very challenging piece of theater. Um, that said, that, 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 that one doesn't just work your way through those challenges to make it a fluid and beautiful play, um, and not just this thing where you're worrying about how are you going to cue this actor, and how are you going to make sure that this actor who doesn't know ASL understands when they're cueing, you know, like all of that bilingual stuff. Um, once you get through that, once you figure out what it is to work with an amazing sign master who enhances what you're creating, what it is to work with interpreters in the room all the time, and all your words are going through the interpreters, be you deaf or hearing, everything is going through these interpreters and you're so dependent on them. Once you get through all of that, I feel like the experience of succeeding with this play is a big part of the awesome thing about doing it because it is, it's going through something huge together. You know, It is challenging and it's fabulous when it actually works. Um, I think that's the point. And then for the audiences, the next step of that is the interface with the audiences and seeing audiences experience something completely unfamiliar in the space is, to me, since I usually just see production, I don't always get in there. I, I very, very seldom am in there in the process. I just hear about it by email, the panic stricken emails. Um, but the audience experience, to me, is one of the more amazing ones, because both for hearing and deaf audiences, it's so rich. It's so rich for a hearing audience to be in silence, you know, and to experience this multilingual thing where they are occasionally left out in a really poetic, significant way. And it's so great for deaf audiences, I think, to be in a space that is just inclusive, you know, that is, it's just part of the story. The deaf character and the language is just part of the story. They're not looking off to the side for their interpreter. They're experiencing it as a cohesive artistic entity, which is, um, that's a big part of what I wanted from this play. Um, access is a wonderful thing. This play is about bilingualness and not about access, if that makes sense. That does make sense. And I think that's a really interesting way for us to continue this conversation because indeed I think the important thing that art can do is not necessarily that we provide access to everybody but that the storytelling itself becomes the point of it that the storytelling is inclusive hi <laughs> <laughs> sorry this is one of my daughters she has to be a loving working okay <laughs> 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 Interpreted to be accessible. 
I think for this moment, maybe I want to turn this over to Bonnie for a second. I'm just going to turn this here so that we can see each other. Um, Bonnie, do you want to talk for a moment? Um, maybe, maybe you can start with. You just saw this play on Friday. Um, and if you have anything, if you have anything you want to start with from, from your experience of watching it, that's great. Um, and also maybe to, to take a moment to talk about this concept of access versus bilingualism. If you have anything you want to add about that. And we're going to, uh, as we do this, uh, we've got a voicer who's going to turn on her mic, and there we go. To be honest, uh, before I got to the venue, I really had no idea what to expect from this play. The only thing that I knew was, first of all, that it would be fully inclusive, and secondly, that both hearing and deaf characters were in written. So I was really looking forward to that. At the same time, I had no idea how the story would progress. And really, my mind was blown. What, I'm trying to think, what was I saying to myself? I wish that more theater was like this. That then the theater community would be in a better place. And I really have you to thank for that. Um, and I'm hoping that other theater companies will see this production and realize, you know, oh, it's not so bad, it's not so complicated. If they can do it, we can do it too. And really, honestly, the deaf community is hungry for this kind of thing in mainstream theater. We are, we're tired of having a separate place for ourselves. And also, I want to add, one thing that's cool about this is that I could come to this show anytime. I did not have, it was not pre-picked for me which day I came. Because usually, typically, there is a limited number of dates that there will be an interpreted event. You can only come on Wednesday. Or you can only come on Sunday afternoon or Saturday morning, you know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm sorry, we want to have equal access to the theater. So this play was really a perfect example because it was fully accessible. And I was also watching the hearing audience's reaction. There were moments where the stage was completely silent. And people were looking at each other because they didn't know how to respond to that kind of situation. They didn't know what they had missed. And you know, for me, I thought that I had missed something too, and realized that it was on purpose. This is, this is part of the playwriting. You want us to have similar experiences in the audience. So you know, the way that it, you wrote this, the way that it was expressed, could not be done anymore. Um, I'm still amazed at how you were able to share your personal experiences, um, your experiences in deaf theater and with deaf community, and working for the hearing community as well, and able to uh, put that on paper. And really, the storytelling allowed us to be part of this. And I'm hoping to see more things like this in the future. So thank you so much, Dana. Aditi, I wonder if you can spend a moment. Oh, we've got some uh, major uh, props going on. Uh, um, I wonder if, if you can uh, take a moment and talk about, from your point of view, as as the playwright, as the person in whose brain this play originally formed itself and had to sort of work itself out on paper and through the development process. I feel like in your conversations with me, you've been talking about how it's important for there to be an audience that has both hearing members and deaf members side by side. And Bonnie was just talking about what that meant for her to have that. As a playwright, what does that mean for you? It's, you know, I feel like the degree to which I get political in my work, which I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not an activist 
playwright per se, but I do feel I do feel like I'd like to see more on our stages that reflects more the society that we are. And it's not because I'm trying to make a point, it's more because it's more interesting that way, you know? Um, and the stories are richer and more complex. And I think for me, the experience of, so theater for me, it, it, it happens somewhere between the performance and the audience. It's not just the production. It's somewhere in the air between the performance and the audience. And it's in the, the reason live theater is so great and actually is different from TV and film, which I very much enjoy TV and film. Um, but live theater is different because there's something about that energy, that vibe that you send off when you're sitting in a house full of people, you know, when there's humans up there on the stage. And there's, there's like an unspoken communion and connection that's happening between everyone. And I feel oh, like that is, oh my god. You, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, look up, I can see her behind <laughs> me. Um, I feel like that experience of a multiplicity of experience and a multiplicity of experiences on the stage Having people sitting next to you, such a troublemaker. Having people sitting next to you who are experiencing the laugh at a different time in the life, who are taking in through a lens that's different from yours, and you can feel their vibe, and you can feel how they're emotionally connecting, and it's making you connect on that level too. That kind of mind, that the mind that happens in the audience is a really beautiful thing for me. Out. I'm not kidding. You're going to end up with no ice cream for dessert. <laughs> Um, that's, so there's, there's the fact that I, I love when, we, when the play starts, there's, there's a lot of noise, there's that whole scene, but then the scene between the two women that's completely sad, the laughing happens. The deaf audience is cool with it. They're laughing, they're, they're with them like from the first moment of that scene. The hearing audience, usually there's this rough, uh, 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 oh, hold on, hold on. discomfort Can that happens. Can you repeat that? Where they're like, who is this? From your audience? Yeah. We have For the um, hearing audience. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have, okay. We're having a little technical issue. Um, can, you, oh, yeah. <laughs> can you back up to say, you were, uh, the place we lost you was, you were about to say something about, you, you talked about how the deaf audience receives that moment but the hearing audience has a different experience of the silent scene. So if you can just pick up yeah. what you were saying there. So the deaf audience is obviously very comfortable with the silent ASL scene. If anything, it's, it's pure because no one's moving their lips around and trying to like make all that noise, right? You are seriously, you're gonna be in so much trouble. Go. Um, you can't, now. Yeah. No, don't talk to me right now, out. Um, the hearing audience, Almost every, well, no, every single production I've seen, at the beginning of that scene, there's this rustle of discomfort amongst them, because it's so quiet, and it's so un uncomfortable that it's just so quiet, and then it passes, and it passes as they get into the story, because there's amazing storytelling and acting generally going on up there on the stage, and it also passes because they notice and they feel that the deaf audience is so comfortable, and that makes them comfortable. And it, 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 it's okay to just sort of relax and be in a silent space for a while. And that's really, I don't know, I love, um, I love that. I love the shift in our mind and in our bodies and in our breathing that happens with that. Um, yeah, the mix of audience, the mix of the characters on stage, is just, it's just a really special thing for me. Mm. Um, Bonnie. Um, you said that about how she's not an activist playwright, but that art has the potential to um, create change, um, especially if the storytelling is um, heartfelt or pure or, or complex enough. Um, as somebody who works day to day with the arts as, as a means of access in some ways, can you talk about sort of your viewpoint on that and, and sort of where, where that sits with your own personal um, 
So I, I see performers in my work daily and work with hearing interpreters on site. And every time I go to a show, I always tell myself, I wish, I just wish that it, everything could become deaf world, mm -hmm. so to speak. Because I feel that the deaf community is not really given a lot of opportunities to really show uh, or really to to see to see what's going on all over the country. There are fabulous deaf actors just waiting to be discovered. They just need an opportunity. But unfortunately, society and hearing society, um, we want Mar says we want Marley Matten because she won the award. And you know, it's like wait a minute. We have other talented actors out there who haven't been given an opportunity to show what they can do, and for whom, um, from whom the organization can become get better. So that's one of my frustrations. I don't see that opportunity happening in my job often enough, and that's one of the reasons that the deaf. Theater Festival back in 2005 was a passion of mine. I wish that I could repeat that. People are so hungry for ASL in storytelling and on the stage. So from that event, it was a three-day festival, I received so much feedback, so much positive feedback, people asking when they could, ha when we could have this kind of thing again. I wish that it was easy to do again. We had a lot of support from the hearing community to help make it happen. And maybe someday it will. Maybe someday it will happen. But the, what, theater, what hearing theater companies don't realize is the millions of audience members that they're losing out there. It's only when they can fully open the doors to the deaf community, when it's a two-way street, when deaf artists can show their work. And you've made that possible. So I'm hoping that this production and this play will become a model. And I want to thank Company One for being uh, brazen and bold enough to, to challenge themselves. Yeah. And it was a great success. I actually have a question for you. Alana, are you up for a question? Yeah. first read this story, what was your first impression? Oh. Um, I actually, uh, so I will say that um, I was lucky enough to lay my hands on a copy of the script um, when it was still, I think maybe just after its first production or first, maybe it was still in development. Um, the original dramaturg on the play was a friend of mine. She had been telling me about it, and I said, I have to read that play. And so she put me in touch with Aditi, and she, Aditi and I, for a long time, uh, were nice friends, but we'd never met in person, because um, I, she sent me the script, and I read it, and my jaw fell on the floor. I thought, not only does this play have an interesting story about people, so there are interesting people, interesting things happen to them. Um, and that's, for me, my definition of good theater is, is it a good story well told? So we had that, but on top of that, you had sort of the intense theatricality of bodies moving through space and time in a way that was unusual for me to see on the stage. It used the elements, as Aditi talked about, the elements of silence for the hearing audience. It used the elements of ASL, but in lots of different ways. One of the things that I, and not just me, certainly the entire uh, production team and audiences and um, 
company have discovered through the performance of this that I don't think is actually possible to know when you're reading it on the page, but actually comes alive when um, when the actor takes this on is um, uh, Jackie. Uh, Jackie, are you in the room? Hi, Jackie. Uh, Jackie, our, our actor um, who serves as the sort of central interpreter in the play between deaf and hearing worlds, um, playing Maggie. One of the things that Jackie talked about, and forgive me if I speak on your behalf, you can throw in anything that you'd like if I get it wrong. Um, one of the things Jackie talked about was the problem of sim um, simultaneous communication, trying to speak and sign two different languages, essentially, at the same time. And the complexities of that um, are not just difficult uh, sort of intellectually, but they're difficult politically. And that was something that I, that's, that has become one of the, the most interesting things about this play that I didn't even know about until we were in the middle of it. So I think that this is one of those scripts that um, as you, when you read it, it is one experience, which I thought was um, stunning and beautiful. And as you work on it and discover more and more about what it means to actually put it into practice, that to me has been stunning as we've gone through it. And and I mean, I'm I'm trying not to be um, hyperbolic here, I'm trying not to exaggerate. But the complexities for me as a theater artist working on this script have been equal to any of the best classical literature like Shakespeare or Moliere, any of those things that yield themselves layer after layer after layer as you work on it. I think none of us actually, as Aditi says, none of us knew what we were getting into when we started the project. And that's probably okay. Like, in fact, I know that's okay. And <laughs> it's, like, you just kind of have to be willing to do it. Um, so for, for us, um, I think that's been, that's been an amazing process. And for Bevan, the director, who sadly just had to leave, but I um, hope she won't mind me speaking on her behalf. Uh, Bevan didn't know sign language before deciding to work on this play and embarked on a course of ASL so that she could effectively communicate in the rehearsal hall and has become pretty good at it, right? She, she pretty much doesn't need the interpreters when talking to the actors or we also have a deaf lighting designer who worked on this play. So that's been really, uh, great, I think, for the hearing artists involved in the production. It's been really great to sort of have access to a new mode of expression and a new mode of communication that I think for a lot of hearing people it can be scary because we're afraid of maybe giving offense. And doing a play like this makes it easier to not be afraid of. And we see in the background the perils of being a working mother, as we all know. <laughs>
So if I were to talk to another company to say, you know, why do a play like this? I actually think one of the greatest benefits is that it helps us as a theater company really be in conversation with a part of our community that beforehand we weren't in conversation with. And if we're invested in making art, and if anybody is invested in making art, the point should be to create those paths of connection. So my advice to other companies would be to take it on and to know that you don't know what you're doing. And the best thing you can do is be transparent about that. You can be transparent and just say, I don't know. That gets you a long way, as we have discovered with all of our amazing, amazing help on this production from the deaf community. We could not have done it without their help and without your help, frankly. So that becomes a real um, value to us as a, co as a company who has as its mission an interest in community. Other companies may not have that interest, and that's okay, that's, that's their business. But for, for us and for other companies like us, I think that it, it makes a, a big impact. I'm wondering now if maybe this would be a great time to open this up to questions from the audience. So a little word about logistics. Here's how this is gonna go. <laughs> we'll work this out as we go. As I was just mentioning about being transparent, here's me being transparent. Um, if you have a question, if you can be so kind as to raise your hand, and um, I'll, I'll figure out what order we'll call on people, and if, if I call on you, if you could stand up, um, uh, give the interpreter a moment to find you in the room, and uh, if you are going to be speaking, we'll hand you a microphone. Um, and so we'll take these questions from the audience. The questions can be for Bonnie or Aditi. Um, or, yeah, I guess, but they're more interesting, so ask them. Um, <laughs> and uh, every once in a while, I'm sure we'll get a couple of questions in from the Twitter audience, and I'll sort of, I'll get a signal from the back of the room that lets us know that that's happening, and we'll take that question. So if you are going to be asking a question, you're going to be signing, it'll be voiced for you, after you as, as you sign, and if you are speaking, it will be interpreted up here. So that's sort of how we'll try and make this work. So, who wants to be brave? Anybody have a question they want to start with? Sabrina? <laughs> <laughs> Our free has a question. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Sabrina. <laughs> Coupled in the world, 
it's funny when they um, when they first read the play, they said, "How do you know how we fight?" And I said, "I don't. That was me and my husband fight." Like, I know nothing about how you fight. I just, you know, people are told that people fight. And I, you know, I write from what I get and what I know. And as far as I can tell you guys never fight, you're too cool to fight. But, you know, the, so the inspiration certainly came from the fact that these two women have this intense bond language-wise, but one of them is hearing. So there's this additional facet to their relationship when they engage the world. Um, and I mean, there's, there's the fact that Lisa, whenever they're, when we go to a bar together, Lisa's hands are always going like she goes to drink. She can't go to like food. She's always signing it. You know, it's a part of their world, a part of their reality. So a lot of it was inspired by them. But then a lot of the, the, the relationships, and, you know, I've been married for a lot of years. I think every frustration and fight that I've had might have worked its way into some relationship in that way. <laughs> So um, the, that part, I think, is more from a universal place. The part about the, the uh, um, deaf and hearing partnership, I took a lot from observations of them. Does that sort of answer the question? Yes. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Yes. Um, another yes. Do we have other yes. questions from the audience? Yes.
the deaf community can be very sensitive and also very political, very quickly uh, made political. But you made it clear that you are involving the deaf community during the writing process and also asking for their feedback, their input, and I think that that was invaluable. Um, that 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 was what led to acceptance for you. I think that if you had gone on on your own and written this play without any of that input and without any of that involvement, it may have been a very different reaction. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we have a question over there. I have a comment to add. It was obvious that deaf people were involved in this production. I could tell from the first minute. Um, helping with the language and making sure that uh, the signing was clear. I really want to applaud the cast. They did a fantastic job. I was inspired. I am also in a hearing and deaf relationship. <laughs> and um, you know, it made me laugh. In the beginning of that relationship, um, there were a lot of cultural conflicts. And you were showing some of that. Like the sign for poetry. I mean, really. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the sign for music. Um, and hearing people love music. And everyone's always saying, why don't you deaf like music? You know, so, um, so I enjoyed it. Congratulations to all of the cast. Great job to all of you. And, and of course, the author as well. Thank you. And I just sat <laughs> down the arm of my chair, so um, I'm going to say that's the end of my... I have a question for somebody in the audience. I hope, Alberto, you don't mind if I single you out. Do it. Um, so Alberto uh, was one of our, um, he's our sign master, essentially, and, and one of our, our ASL consultants. And um, I wanted to ask you, Alberto, if you would, if you had anything you wanted to add about what it is um, there was a comment about the precision of the sign, the, the, the language um, that the actors were able to use. Can you talk about, just because I think the position of sign master is probably mysterious to people who have not had that experience before. Can you say anything about what that was for you as somebody working on the show? Minneapolis, so that has a certain accent to it in ASL. 
um, and how does that affect the characters and their signing and what their language <laughs> looks like? We have some actors who are really beautiful signers and we have to make them look a little bit less proficient and that was a huge responsibility. <laughs> So, you know, that's the concept. That's what I was doing here during rehearsal, so. Thank you, Alberto. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, Aditi, can you, um, can you talk for a moment about, uh, for you as a playwright, I know that you also have, um, in the creation process, you had to think a lot about when your words would, were, were going to stay your words and when they would be given over to, uh, to a sign master and to other, to actors who have their own styles of sign, right? That it can't, it, I mean, playwrights have to do this all the time with actors and their, their words, but for, for you, I think it was a little bit different. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I knew, I knew that, um, in, that in the end, all of the ASL that I was writing would end up being translated and differently for every production by whichever sign master and the team and the director and the actors. And one of the really beautiful things to me about the um, the process of deaf actors is that as their characters evolve, as their understanding of their characters evolves, what they're saying also changes. And that's very different from hearing theater, where you have to say those words. I don't care if you're feeling differently today, or if you wanted this character to go so you have to say these words. That's not the case with, you know, deaf theater, because, oh, you know what? If we're going to go that way, then maybe this sign choice is better. And so it evolves. Um, so I don't have the kind of control over the things that get translated into ASL, as I do over the things that will be spoken by an actor in, in English. That said, I also had to find, the, like, so the balance I needed to find was, I needed to find the balance between letting the language be um, direct enough that it wouldn't be difficult to translate, um, and at the same time, making sure that what ended up on the screen as access for the hearing audience was interesting and had tension and energy and poetry to it so that it wouldn't be, you know, uninteresting. <laughs> For the hearing, body, that doesn't understand the sign. So it was a weird balancing act, and I think over the first three productions, it evolved. Like we discover, oh, invariably we discovered that something I've written could not be translated into ASL. It was untranslatable the way I've written it because I've woven some metaphor into it that just was not possible. Um, so either I simplify or I say, can you help me come up with a metaphor that does work? And then this amazing group of like sign masters and actors would play with it. They'd play with the idea. They'd say, why do you care about this? Why do you need a symbol? They'd think of something. I'd go, oh, I've got a good one. And then somewhere between us, we'd come up with the English with the ASL that worked. And even so, I know that as it goes into every single future production, it is. <laughs> <laughs> As it goes into every single production, it is getting reinvented. And I hope that the language I created has enough pliability and enough give to it that that is something that can happen with every future production. And at the same time, I hope that the language I created has enough structure that the characters will remain centered and sound the way that I want them to. Like, it's very important to me that, um, that certain characters be very tough and be very strong and defensive. And I don't want that to morph into a gentleness and a pleading. So I try really hard in the language to lock that down and at the same time allow for space for them to be tough in whatever way this actor does tough with their language. It's a weird balance. It's very, very hard. I still haven't, I haven't figured it out or anything, but I hope the script has space in it for that kind of creativity with each team. Uh, very, yeah, that's, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge as a writer to have to think on, on all of those levels at once. We have, any, we have other questions from the audience. Oh, wait, yes, we have a Twitter question. What, is, what does Twitter have to say? Uh, oh. Hello. Twitter is wondering, where are the Sanskrit audiences? <laughs> <laughs> well... I guess we don't have any Sanskrit audiences in this room right now. 
Thank you, Twitter. <laughs> Way to go. Um, Hax, did you have a question? <laughs> I was wondering, why is it so many deaf folks seem to have questions and none of the hearing audio? <laughs> Where are you guys? We have a question over here. How long did it take you to write this script? You know, to think it up and to write it out. How long did it take? Oh, um, I've been a one year residence, well, okay, so that first seed of an idea came about a year and a half before I wrote a single word down. So there was stuff in my head during that time. And then um, when I started writing it, the first draft, with, which I have to say was not a good draft, um, probably took me, I probably wrote it over the course of three months. Um, and it wasn't good, and I probably would have uh, not gone back to it because it didn't achieve what I wanted to achieve. It sort of fell short of what I imagined, um, except that I got into a Playwrights Week at the Lark Play Development Center in New York, and um, I thought, oh no, now I have to do something to make this play better. Because <laughs> otherwise I'm going to be in Playwrights Week in New York with a terrible play. Um, and that's when Liz, my dramaturg, got involved. So from there on out, I would say it was about a year and a half, maybe, maybe a year and a half, about two years until this premiere production, and I was still changing things through the first production because there were things about the technology and the email aspects that we couldn't know until we did it for real. Um, so I was still writing through that one. I think I did some tweaks before it got published. So I don't know, the first draft three months, but it was bad, it was very, very bad. And then another two and a half, three years of fiddling, probably a year of strong fiddling, and then, you know, more. I stop now, I'm leaving it alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that um, that work, that length of work, especially on the technological aspects, um, it shows, because for us as a company, when we went through the process of trying to deal with the technology, which in fact we had to put into the rehearsal room in order for us to be able to do any of it right. We had to have our projection designer making projections very early on. Um, in order for all that to work, we, we discovered pretty quickly that we could trust the script, right? That you had actually done the majority oh, yeah. of the work on like what, when things had to be timed, how long a scene was, how long the interaction was, that stuff which I think before we started working on it, we thought was malleable or that we were gonna have to figure that out. There was actually a lot of relief for us as, as the artists bringing this into the world on this stage, that all of that actually was all in the, in the script. And I think that has a lot to do with the depth of work you did on it before the script got to us. So mm. thank you for that, because that was oh, a huge... That's really good to hear. <laughs> really made it so much easier for us. Um, we are nearing the end of the allotted time we have for this conversation.